not the least of which is that there was a lot of discussion about um, the U.S. health system and the difficulty that we're in. I think the, the United States health system is undergoing really a, a, a huge change and we're going to see the need as things go forward for a, a big change in the way we train physicians, especially in the postgraduate years and the residency years. So we've heard from Mike and Ed about um, conceptually how we're gonna go forward with this medical school. We've heard from Leanne about medical students. I wanna spend a few minutes with you all this afternoon as the last speaker talking about graduate medical education and residences and uh, what we might need to teach physicians of the future in their postgraduate years or, or graduate years uh, to be able to uh, exist in this system uh, as it may be. So we think that there probably are um, six sets of competencies that we would need to teach in those years. Now, some of you who know about the ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education in the United States, uh, will know that that body has promulgated six competencies also. And these are intentionally different. Um, some of them overlap, some of them are much different. Um, I think some of them are a little bit more specific. Um, we heard uh, that the WHO this morning is looking for not so much the what, but the how. So this lecture is going to be very much focused on the how of doing this. The first of these is leadership. Um, and I've given you some quotes here from an American general, Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, I, I think sometimes medicine gets siloed. And sometimes we fail to learn from other disciplines who have done great work in certain areas that we ought to be paying attention to. So typically, military organizations do great work in leadership. Uh, and these are some of, of uh, General Schwarzkopf's quotes about leadership. Great leaders probably need several qualities. They need to set high expectations. And then they need to demand of people that they follow those expectations. They need to have the integrity to stick with those expectations, even in difficult times, and the courage to continue to expect those things from people, even when there is a great amount of fear. And, and I think that's something that you find in the American healthcare system now. Uh, what's driving much of this is um, a lack of knowledge about where we need to go to be able to develop a system that works for our patients. And I told Ted this morning, you all have to forgive me, I'm an old guy, I use the word patients. Um, substitute persons, people for that. Um, and I think um, leadership is a huge issue in this. It is um, one of the of the competencies that the American Academy of Family Physicians lists primarily as they uh, speak about the needs for a patient-centered medical home. And I think this is something that we absolutely must teach residents. When I think about person-centered medical, um, person-centered medicine, I think about advocacy. Um, some of you all may know the name Don Berwick, Donald Berwick. Don Berwick is a pediatrician by training. Um, he was a former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is um, the United States uh, governmental organization that regulates um, essentially payment and the system that we use for seniors and um, for the indigent and disabled. These two quotes are from a speech that Don Berwick gave to the graduating class of the Harvard Medical School um, about a year ago now. And he gave it in the form of, interestingly, a narrative about a previous patient that he had, a patient by the name of Isaiah. Um, Don talks about two things in this speech. He talks about a compass, and it's pointing true north, and that true north is to how it will help the patient. And that is the first responsibility. And the second responsibility is because of the rights and licenses that we get as physicians from society, we have the obligation to use that voice to speak up in public disclosure, to advocate for those people who cannot advocate for themselves and for our patients. And I think this is a huge, important 
competency that we need to teach future doctors. The ability to advocate for their patients and for those who can't speak for themselves. The third thing, and you've heard about this before from Ed, is team building. Future of medicine, at least in the United States, I think, is our healthcare teams. And the ability to put together a team is something um, very foreign to medical students in the United States and residencies in the United States. They are selected for their individualism. They are selected, and, and what is promoted in medical school and residency is autonomy. And doctors get out, and they have a very, very difficult time sort of making that autonomy, autonomy um, subservient to the idea of forming a consensus. So we have to teach them that working together and building teams and forming a consensus is the way to get to the base, best care for patients. We also need to teach them that using the insight and the expertise of various team members will get them to that best care. And then thirdly, if there's disagreement, promoting interdisciplinary or interprofessional discussion about what goes on with that patient is likely to help them reach a consensus on the best care for that patient. So team building is the third one. There's been some discussion this morning about evidence-based practice. I think everything that's been said is absolutely true. Interestingly, one of the people who's done the most work on evidence-based practice um, is actually a Canadian physician by the name of David Sackett. And some of you all may know that name too. And David Sackett says an interesting thing in an article about what is and is not evidence-based practice. He says that the practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical experience, individual clinical experience, with the best available external evidence from systematic research. So as Juan asked a little bit today, what is evidence-based medicine? It's clinical experience. It is the experience of the practitioner as that experience relates to the patient, along with the best available evidence. And with both of, without both of those things, you don't get the best result. Don Merwick also talks about um, provider groups beginning to monitor their own participants to track the effects of treatment. This was as early as 2005. And most importantly, um, from a fellow by the name of Montori, and again, a Mayo Clinic trained physician that some of you may know, whatever the evidence value and preference judgments are implicit in every clinical decision. So we need to look at evidence in the context of the patient and make sure we are doing things that will make a difference for the patient. So evidence-based medicine is not just taking research and trying to fit it into a groove with that patient. It is taking that research, clinical expertise, clinical evidence, and also what makes sense for the patient in terms of outcome and integrating those three things to come a best treatment. Patient safety, something really near and dear to my heart. Before I, I did this, I was the chief medical officer at a hospital. You all know about um, all of the risk of being in a hospital. Another great reason to keep people healthy. I think residents need to understand the concept of system breakdown and the concept that adverse events often are the result of those system breakdowns and that by being transparent about medical errors, we can redesign systems into high reliability organizations. And that ultimately then we need to translate that information to what's called the microsystem, the point of the delivery of care. And the feedback mechanism then for that whole system is the practitioner or the professional who directs that care having a sort of wariness or patient safety vigilance about what's going on in delivery and feeding back into that mechanism that then allows us to redesign systems because we know the errors. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. That quote has been attributed to various people 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly who said it, but I think it's great. Um, it probably goes back as far as a fellow by the name of Edward Edwards Deming, who uh, redesigned American manufacturing and actually Japanese manufacturing a number of years ago. I think it's important that we teach residents that systems are composed of multiple interconnected components and that the goal of the system is to maximize the output of the entire system, not just any single component within the system. That the output of that system then has multiple dimensions, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, all of the things that Ed talked about. And that these systems are open. They receive information from, and they give information to, other systems. And that both these complex systems and these open systems are at risk for producing unintended consequences. And we all see those every day in medicine. So these are the things I think, in addition to the medical knowledge that we have to transfer to our medical students, to our residents, to our physicians, who are newly out of training, that will make them be able to function within a system that we hope will not only respond to, but, re be, but be responsive to the patients that we all care so much about.